you know, the, the purple room is, is the, the classic example of a collaboration where I did all the code, I had done all the coding and I had given John a rough outline of his, what I, I envisioned the room to look like. And he came back with this just phenomenal description. And I, I remember my, I'm, my jaw dropped when I read it. I'm like, that's the, that's what's got to get in there. So the collaboration allows you to take the best of both worlds, right? You, you, you take a strength of someone who can, who can write like that. And then you take a strength of someone who can code with some solid background, you put two together and you get a, I think you get a, a decent game. You're not going to get the best game, obviously, but you're going to get something that is playable. And I think that's what it's all about. For, for No Time to Squeal, I had the layout of the story and how it was broken down over the events. And, um, but none of the scenery was done and none of the character dialogue was done. It was just high level uh, discussion points. And I just gave him cop blanche, here you go. And I still remember Send, uh, sending him the first draft of the first opening scene. Here's what I anticipated going on. And getting that first document from Rob and going, wow, knowing that I would have spent years trying to do what he did and I could never do it. So I was pretty impressed and got me really psyched up. Um, and that carried throughout the rest of the, the rest of the game. So, But it was more of him doing the actual writing. I just kind of gave him some bullets and some direction on where to go. And, and Rob would... Um, I take that back. What I end up doing too is then I would play the game after I would take his first scene in and I would say, well, this is a, an action that the player should do and here's another action that the player should do. Make sure you write for that. So if it was as simple as, you know, examining the, the china in a, in, a, in, a, in a cupboard, I would just put examine china and he would come back with a three or four sentence just you know, description of what that would be. So that's how the, the dialogue would go. As a matter of fact, I do, and I try to get myself out of it because I'd rather be more eclectic, but, you know, I'm a realist at, uh, um, by heart, so I tend to go for realism, and that's what Above and Beyond was really written about, and so that was my next one, uh, follow that was At Wit's End, was a real story. There was no fantasy elements. There was no magical elements. Um, the way I wanted to approach it was it could happen. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the speed F I, games I did was um, it could happen to you. That, that's been my theme all along. I, I just I gravitate toward a story that you can put yourself in the in the uh, primary character's role and say that could happen to me. And I, I try to break away from that. I ultimately go on ah that can't happen, so I don't write about it. With no time to squeal. And then uh, subsequent to that with John Ingold in Till Death, uh, uh, Make a Monkfish Out of Me, and I forgot the name of my own game. <laughs> um, I, I was allowed to break that genre where we did some fantasy type elements. Uh, the, the game we wrote with, uh, that I wrote with John Ingold was pure science fiction and, you know, with machines that would transfer your consciousness you know i would never have come up with that as a solo author but with a collaboration i was allowed to explore that because i had that you know other person that would drag me there um the first one i wrote <laughs> i thought it'd be done in a month you know and i had lined up my beta testers already and uh i kept sending them up not ready not ready not ready and it was really uh it was an eye-opener to see just exactly how long it takes to get something like this done. And again, it, it, it goes back to quality too. If you want to have a quality piece of interactive fiction, you have to go through the paces of having beta testers and um, fixing the bugs and making the suggested recommendations and rewriting some of the scenes. So it's it definitely takes some time. I think it's bug fixing. It really is. You know, Once you get into the mode of coding, you're just flying through it and you know what you need to do and you're adding the, putting the text on top of it and you're creating all the objects and all that. And it's when you stop playing through it and you give your first, you know, release to your first round of beta testers and you get all these bugs back and you go, holy cow, um, that's probably the most time consuming. And that's the piece I think a lot of authors don't appreciate. Um, maybe they come or not a lot of authors don't appreciate, but they might not uh, understand if they're first time authors that once you finish coding a game, you're only halfway done. Once your beta testers get it and make recommendations of this should be worded this way, this puzzle, you need a different way to solve it. That's where the extra time comes in. And uh, we fell in love, not with the game, but with the actual cover. Uh, if you remember, the cover was 
this dungeon scene with um, uh, uh, some person brandishing a sword. And uh, so we thought it was the coolest thing. So we went and popped it in his Apple computer and literally days went by and all we did was play the game. So that got me hooked back in, in the early 80s and then um, spent a good part of the 80s instead of doing homework and going to school to actually, uh, you know, play all these games. Wrote a game. I had a bulletin board system at the time. Put it on the BBS and uh, had people actually play it uh, through the BBS, which was pretty cool. So that kind of got me hooked on creating games and having folks other than myself play it. And, and so and I'm jumping ahead, but when I got back into the scene in the late 90s and I saw that, wow, this thing is still going on, that's what really got me back into the, into the groove of creating them. Um, I had that in mind and it was one of the puzzles in the Recruit, which was uh, the last game I've done. I entered it into the uh, competition a couple of years ago. And it looks super, and this is going to be a part of the spoiler, I guess. It looks super complicated when you walk in. And it's got hundreds of knobs and pulleys and, and levers and all that. And you're trying to figure out. And they all actually work. They're all red herrings. And it's real simple to solve. Um, so it led me to that one, which was I like the multi-staged uh, puzzle and but you can have multi-stage puzzles be really simple as well I guess I'm asking kind of a theoretical question which is I mean you know when you sit down you work on something like the recruit you know who is it for me I wrote it for me and as selfish as that sounds I'm the one that's spending all the time designing the the, the puzzles designing the game flow um, writing the code testing it and not taking away, the testers are phenomenal. And, and the testers that I've had, I've been very lucky to work with some of the best, I think. Um, but ultimately, when I sit down and do something, it's for me. I try to polish it to a certain extent where certain people might like it. Not everyone's going to like it because not everyone will like everything. But uh, yeah, I, I end up ultimately writing the game and putting those extra touches for me because that's my hobby. And if, if the general public likes it, great. Like it was, again, like it was rewarded with one of the awards at the end of the year. Um, and I believe the recruit came in top 10 that year. So I thought it was well received. Um, but I'm not, I'm not writing for a certain player or a certain audience. It's, it's just, you know, it's my hobby. So, you know, I want to get something out of it as well. It, the, the line I use is, it's, thank God this is a hobby. <laughs> because you're not getting paid for it. You know, you might write a game and you might get three emails in a year thanking you for, hey, that was a great game, or what the heck were you thinking because I couldn't get past the opening scene. Um, so you're certainly not doing it for the accolades or, or any, uh, you know, commercialization of it. You're just doing it because it's a hobby and, and leave it at that. Uh, when I have time, I do. I, I enjoy you know, uh, firing up IF, I'll, I'll tell you if, if I, my rule of thumb is I'll fire up any IF game and I will know instinctively within three or four minutes whether or not I'm going to invest any of my time. You know, there's so much out there now that, you know, again, you know, time is precious and, and across the board for everybody that I'm not going to go and spend countless hours of my time, you know, wading through a game that someone only took four hours to write. So I'm very selective when it comes to games and I do appreciate it. And usually when I do play it, um, I'll try to send a note to the author because I know what it's like on the other side to say, hey, good job, you know, um, thanks for putting that out there. Yeah, Speed IF is, is, is cool both as an author and as a player. Um, I, I've done one Speed IF game and I had a tremendous, you know, I had a blast writing. I think the rules were you get it done in two hours and, um, which led to some, you know, funny bugs and some funny typos. Um, but it was it was fun, and uh, I'd love to do it again if I have the opportunity. Playing Speed IF is aggravating because you don't have a lot of time to really take care of uh, some of the obvious choices that you would see in a game. So you find yourself banging your head up against the wall, you know, a number of times. Um, so I'm not a I'm not a huge fan of playing it for that reason because it goes back to time is precious. Um, but still, some of them are done very well, and some of them are actually very good games. As far as the kind of games that I gravitate to, it could be anything as long as it's done well. You know, it could be a story-based game, 
a very you know uh, plot driven game or a puzzle driven game as long as it's got some polish on it and, and you could tell the author cared about it and spent the right time you know tying some loose ends and making sure that it's done right I'll play it without question I've been sort of um, silent for the past couple of years because of that my kids are getting older um, a little more responsibility uh, at work so that takes away from your quote-unquote hobby time and you know there are so many choices now for entertainment you know I'm not a TV guy so I don't watch TV but um, I do have an Xbox 360 <laughs> that ends up taking more time than you know four years five years ago did because you know, I didn't have it so I got to play IF so I, I do find that you know there's only so many hours in a day and that you can only cut up so much for IF um, but because IF has been such a, a a big part of my growing up and and gamemanship, if you will, over the past twenty plus years. It's always going to have a spot in you know in my <laughs> in my queue for um, for playing it. Uh, I entered the IF art show a couple three years back, and I wrote a, a game for the event session, which is it was a it was actually my backyard. That's what it was. And I had I have a bunny problem in my backyard. Even though I have some beagles, um, the bunnies just continue to multiply like crazy. So they were eating. They were doing a number on my garden. So that was my inspiration for this, you know, IF art show game. So I wrote about the bunny, and the the goal of the game was to capture the bunny, and then you captured it and you, you know, let it go somewhere else. And so. I spent quite a bit of time uh, writing it and doing it and thinking of all the different things you can do about it. And I actually sat down with my kids last year and we played it and they had a blast. Now, they didn't know how to play IF, but what they would do would say, Dad, try this. So then I would translate the, 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 uh, their request into the IF command prompt and then the game would respond with something. They thought it was the neatest thing. And um, I haven't found any other games really to do that with, but I do anticipate, you know, you know dragging them in. <laughs> well, I think it's on cruise control, really. I, I don't think the advances made, you know, in the last ten years is enough to catapult it back into the into the mainstream. Um, but with so many people now getting online, you know, and it, that number is going to continue to increase, you're just going to have a lot more people to draw from and and get into it. So I don't think it's it's ever going to go away. Um, it's, there's still people writing, you know. Uh, games for the the Commodore 64 and the old cartridges, right? There's still a, a, a niche uh, community that does that. So I just think there's enough people to keep it going. It's certainly interesting. It could be used as a teaching tool, and um, you know, there's a you know, a lot of people like reading books, and it's really just a different form of that if it's done if it's done right.